All right. Uh, well, again, welcome everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are a team from Lab Exchange at Harvard University. And we're going to be talking today about um, one of our favorite topics, how to empower educators. And the platform uh, that we're going to show you today, Lab Exchange, is a fantastic way to do that that allows you to remix digital content, creating a really flexible education tool. Um, so today we're going to take you through uh, what Lab Exchange is, and more importantly, why it was developed, and some of the, the um, you know problems in education that we're working to address. Uh, we're going to take you on a tour of the resource and show you how you can use this uh, in your classroom if you're practicing, or um, be aware of this resource to share with others. And uh, we'll of course have time for Q and A, but we invite you to ask questions at any point during our presentation today. Please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, we're a small group today, so you can also just unmute and, and interrupt us at any time. Um, you're going to get a sneak peek at some of the exciting things that are coming soon to Lab Exchange, and then we're excited to close with a discussion with all of you um, about how our platform can help to uh, contribute to equity in science education through scale. So I want to uh, give everybody on our team a chance to introduce themselves. So Pierre, I'll turn it over to you first. So hi, my name is Pierre. I'm talking to you from France. And so it's pretty late over here. Um, and I'm working uh, with Lab I've been working with Lab Exchange for a little bit more than a year now, um, especially focusing on partnerships in Europe. And Marty. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to meet you all today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to get a chat with you. Um, my name is Marty Samuels. I have uh, my background in like structural biology and biochemistry, and I've been working uh, at Harvard for like the past nine to 10 years, like teaching intro biology and cell biology and, and structural biology classes. And uh, I was super excited to have the opportunity. I'm, I'm probably the newest member of, of the team who's on this presentation panel at the moment, um, but I was super excited to uh, uh, to join Lab Exchange only a few months ago, like in, in July or June or one of those months with Jay in it, uh, as if the time means anything anymore. And, um, and my role is the head of content, so I help um, set like the agenda for what content we're developing and how we are on the website. And uh, with that, I get to hand it off to basically the most important person on, the, on this phone call, which is uh, Jessica. Oh, thank you. No, we're, we are um, a surprisingly lean team at Lab Exchange. So everybody wears multiple hats um, and I'm no exception. So my name is Jessica Silverman. Uh, I am a former researcher and high school teacher. Um, and I'm really excited to be here supporting educators. Uh, one of my many hats is to run our professional development workshops and help folks use this tool in their classroom. Another one of my hats is to build relationships with organizations that bring their content to our library, which is uh, something that we'll be spending a lot of time taking a look at today and uh, bringing resources for you and your students to use and, uh, and remix. Um, so we would love to get to know you. Uh, so we're going to try out this tool, WooClap. Um, so you can navigate to the website here, which Pierre will put in the chat for you, or you can scan this QR code. And we would love to know a little bit more about you. We're going to ask you um, what your job title is, what you teach if you're currently teaching, and your goals for today's workshop. So um, you'll see each of those questions pop up. So we'll start. Number one, um, what is your job title? If you can throw that into WooClap. We should see those pop up here. We'll give you about 30 seconds to pop that in. We're curious to know, are you teachers that are with us today? Are you administrators? Uh, what are you involved in? Awesome, librarian, fantastic. All right, we are a small but diverse group today. That's great. Um, all right. We would also love to know if you teach, um, you can use the word teach uh, subjectively here. Um, what subjects do you teach? And this will help us so we can point out some resources as we go today that will be most applicable for all of you. All right, they're starting to show up there. If you haven't had a chance, again, we'd love to hear what you teach. So far we have digital humanities and information literacy, which are two fantastic skills here. All right, last chance, anybody else? Someone okay. type it in the chat as well, biology. Yeah, since we're in a small committee, feel free as well to type in the chat. But if you want to see your, if you want to see your uh, answers on the big screen, um, like <laughs> WooClap is really easy to use. 
but we're reading you in the chat. Don't worry. Don't oh, worry. fantastic. All right. Um, so the last thing we'd love to get a sense for what you're hoping to get out of our time together today, again, so that we can make sure that we're pointing out resources um, and tailoring our presentation to all of you. So are you here with us to discover new resources for teaching? Are you maybe looking for remote alternatives for labs and experiments? Oh, lots of people are here to get a look at Lab Exchange. And of course, if you uh, do have an other, let us know at any time in the chat. All right, great. Well, thank you all. It's a, again, a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'm sure we're gonna get to know you a little bit more as we go on today. Um, so our goals for today are um, first and foremost to learn how Lab Exchange is really working to address gaps in access and equity in science education. Uh, and, and I mentioned at scale earlier, and we are a global platform and, and you'll see growing quickly in terms of the uh, amount of content that we have to offer, the community that supports us. Uh, so we are excited to share all of that with you. Um, and specifically, we're going to explore how content on Lab Exchange, uh, including those virtual lab simulations that some folks are uh, interested in, um, can support both different differentiated learning, but also um, learning in a, either a remote or a hybrid setting, which has become, uh, you know, much more common um, these days. We're going to share with you a few professional development and implementation resources. Uh, we want you to walk away from today feeling like this is a tool that you can use tomorrow if you want to get started um, and having all the supports that you need to do that. And then, uh, as I said, we're gonna finish off with a discussion with all of you today to talk about how these free and open learning resources, both from Lab Exchange and, and of course other providers, um, but combined with community support can really foster the next generation of scientists. All right, sorry for moving everybody around. Here we are. Um, so we just wanna tell you a little bit about what Lab Exchange is, and again, sort of the impetus for its creation and what we're working to uh, address. Um, so if you've never heard of Lab Exchange, I know I uh, read through our, our website many, many times before the platform launched to try to get a sense of what it is. It's a lot of things as you'll see today, but fundamentally um, it's a collection of teaching and learning resources on our library, which we'll take a tour of, but it's supported by a global community of educators, learners, and scientists. And that's the thing that I think really makes Lab Exchange unique is that it offers these social tools that really allow for a community supported environment for learners to, to flourish. Uh, and of course, another important piece is free and customizable. Uh, so we are founded at Harvard and we are funded by the Amgen Foundation. So uh, please keep in mind that everything that you're seeing today is available completely for free. We're gonna talk about some of the uh, extra features that come with an account, uh, but that is also free. So free, 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 everything you see today is free. Uh, and before I turn things over to Pierre to tell you a little bit about what drives us, I just wanted to share a quote from our faculty director, uh, you know, that I, I really keep in mind as I um, work on the Lab Exchange project. I think it really uh, indicates what guides all of us. We're really looking to create a world with equal opportunity for success in science for anyone, anywhere. And it's a big goal. It's a big ask. Uh, but we have, I think, the tools in place um, to begin to make a difference in this sphere. So um, Pierre is going to tell you a little bit more about our work and uh, what inspires us. All right. Well, hi, everybody. And uh, hello to the and hello and welcome to, to the participants that are joining us. I think I saw uh, Felix and uh, probably Lori and Mario. Welcome, welcome. Uh, you're joining us at, at a great time. So. Um, a little bit of background information on, on, on Lab Exchange. Um, the concept of Lab Exchange uh, came uh, came to light uh, because of you know a double challenge uh, that uh, science educators face. Right, the first one is that, um, as Marty brilliantly put it, science is fundamentally an act of experience-based learning. Without doing experiments, it is very hard to um, uh, to, to acquire some knowledge uh, in uh, any kind of scientific class. And that has three uh, consequences when it comes to accessibility and inclusivity in, uh, in science classrooms. First, well, teaching institutions and educated, uh, educate, uh, education organizations uh, sometimes lack equipment and materials and time and resources to uh, um, probably offer those experiments uh, to their students. The second uh, big um, issue is that experiments, they re really need to be um, contextualized and properly and benefit from the appropriate pedagogical framework. They need to be part of a teaching scenario of a pedagogical pathway. And you will see 
that were very uh, attached to this, uh, to this word of pedagogical pathway uh, in order for the experimentation to make sense and to uh, generate the maximum amount of, uh, of learning uh, to, for, for any kind of, uh, uh, of students. And finally, it can be very, very hard to implement them remotely. And although that was probably not the norm in the past when lab exchange started and we uh, went out of the beta at the during the uh, last days of January and uh, early February. So, so it was another world back then in which uh, le learning remotely was definitely the, except the exception and not the norm. But the other side of that uh, challenge in science education is that uh, when it comes to online science learning, well, it is far too often very vertical and insufficiently interactive. And by that, I mean, everybody here has taken a MOOC most of the time. MOOCs, they are uh, nothing more than very long videos in which you have to sit through all of it and sometimes have a few uh, base level interactions. This means that it's very passive learning and thus it yields less results. But on top of that, uh, the pedagogical resources that you can have to use uh, when you're building a co um, an online class, well, they can be very hard to navigate either for you as an educator or for the learners. Uh, and the reason why they are hard to navigate is not because they are too hard to find. Now we can find them, but it's difficult to integrate them seamlessly uh, into a course. Um, so, so that's it for this double challenge. And why does it really matter is because when it comes to STEM, uh, STEM is a field uh, that um, is plagued by a lot of inequalities of access to education and of success in this edu in education. So we have, uh, we have selected a couple of facts there and I tried to source them with very recent numbers for them to be really relevant. So when it comes to uh, the Upper, to uh, the college education in the US. Uh, women earn overall slightly more bachelor degrees than male, right? They go, when they declare a major, they go to the end of it uh, and they get the bachelor more often than men, except in STEM. And it's pretty much the only field in which it is the case in which uh, women tend to, like only 36% of them tend to, uh, to, to earn that degree while 64% of men uh, do so. In the world, only 35% of, of STEM students are women in higher education. And um, to uh, move on from, uh, gender, from gender inequalities towards um, ethnic, ethical and socioeconomical um, inequalities, uh, Latinx and Black college students are far more likely to drop out of school uh, when they are studying STEM than white students, right? Like it's uh, 26 at worst, I think it's 24 for Latinx actually, 26 for black against 30%, uh, only 30% of uh, white students drop out of uh, school when they are studying st STEM. And um, of course, as we we're saying, access to good material, good uh, pr proper equipment is essential and critical to be able to um, teach science in the right conditions. And uh, in schools uh, in which more than 75% of the students qualify for subsidized or free, lunch, uh, free lunches, uh, only 49% of the teachers declare that they have enough resources to teach sciences properly. Uh, while it is more than 75% for uh, schools that, have, uh, that are a bit less disenfranchised. And uh, yeah, that's a little side note uh, for now. We, we start seeing a lot of uh, studies on how COVID-19 impacts um, the learning uh, experience in a classroom. Uh, so in France, we already have some official numbers since we had a mandatory nationwide uh, stay at home order. And uh, so that applied to 12 million of um, learners from elementary school to high school. And um, usually only 30,000 students learn from home, learn remotely in France. So all of a sudden, uh, the, the number uh, was multiplied by, uh, you know, this absurdly huge, uh, absolutely huge amount. Um, 
and uh, at least five to eight percent of those students dropped out in just those three months. And um, those are the numbers of the Ministry of Education. So you can expect, and actually most of the unions expect that um, it is much, the, 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 the consequences are much more dramatic than that. And that the, the actual students that dropped out and stopped, completely stopped um, tuning in remote school, uh, tuning in remotely at school is the double, uh, the, is the double amount of those numbers. So uh, this whole project also fits within the um, uh, global sustainable development goal agenda uh, that was identified by the UN. And I'm probably gonna uh, move through that a little bit quickly. Of course, um, Lab Exchange was, uh, was uh, conceived with uh, SDG number four in mind, right? To ensure the quality of education for all. Most of those sub-targets that I've listed there are about uh, having a truly inclusive education and uh, equal access to education, but also uh, to further and um, improve sustainable development education and, uh, uh, you know, f uh, encourage a new generation of leaders uh, that will be able to engage with sustainable development in a significant manner. But we also uh, target some other SDG goals uh, so I threw a couple of them there, uh, but of course, gender equality and for the same reasons, uh, because uh, Lab Exchange also tries to ensure that any kind of user uh, can participate and learn equally on the platform, but also um, to, um, since Lab Exchange is open to any kind of institution, any kind of learner, any kind of educator all around the globe. We try to enhance scientific research and scientific co cooperation and collaboration throughout the board. So that's nine and 17 SDG. And finally, because um, health and health education uh, is part of good health, we also try to tackle the third uh, SDG. And I think that's it for this uh, little background of where does that ID come from and why is it uh, relevant, uh, the work we do and the work that uh, the place of open education resources in uh, science teaching remotely. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pierre, for the uh, introduction to the project. And, um, you know, again, an invitation to put any questions that you may have in the chat or to speak up if you have questions on that. Um, I think one of the exciting things about Lab Exchange is that it's continually evolving. And so this is a project that has been co-developed with educators and students from the start. And so as we uh, you know, learn more and, and the needs change um, for our users, the, the platform continues to adapt as well, which of course we've certainly seen uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so with that, we're going to take you on a little tour of Lab Exchange. But before we do, we want you to think just a little bit about some of the resources that you may already be using, um, free online resources that you might use in your courses, uh, and thinking about what be, might be some of the big pain points uh, for using those resources, um, and specifically helping you think about um, when you're teaching classes remotely, what tools you're using there. So we're going to head on over to uh, our, our favorite Wu Club here for just a moment to um, get a, a pulse on how everyone is feeling about those things. Um, oopsies, I think we may have gone a little far ahead. There we go. Um, so just a quick question. How have you used free online resources in your courses uh, if you have used them? Have you maybe used them to guide the creation of your course um, just to kind of get a sense for what's out there? Have you used them uh, as an optional assignment for enhancing your class? Or do you tend to integrate them more fully as a core part of your class? Or maybe you haven't had a chance to try using free online resources just yet. Um, so take a moment to see what, uh, what applies best to you. And for the person who joined us uh, and didn't participate in the first, like, let's get to know each other uh, part, just hit the link that we posted in the chat and it's very straightforward or you can just, uh, could, you can just type it in in any kind of web browser. And it's a great way for us to, 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 um, to know which, like, what are your expectations for this uh, workshop and, uh, and get to know each other, yeah. Fantastic. So it looks like we have a little bit of a split. This is fun to see in real time pulling ahead or using uh, OER as optional pieces here in your class. Maybe not necessarily as the core, but, but quite a spread. So it's very interesting. 
um, wondering kind of what are some of the pain points that might be contributing to those decisions? So are you having difficulty finding good quality resources? Um, are you having difficult finding uh, you know, relevant resources? Is it challenging to integrate those resources into your course or your project? Um, are you finding issues with accessibility of those free resources, either for your learners or perhaps for those uh, creating courses? So it looks like we're seeing the majority of the pain points there around uh, integrating resources somewhat around accessibility and finding the right resources. All right. Well, that's only one answer, uh, Jessica. Oh. oh no! That's a the, like everyone can rate uh, which oh. one is the most uh, painful. Ah, so you oh, can right. see the moving average actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so interesting. All right, so we'll give it another second or two here if you haven't had a chance to weigh in. All right, so I know we're going to address uh, certainly how to find resources today and how to think about integrating them as well. Um, and certainly the accessibility question depends on perhaps the uh, content pieces that you're looking at there. All right, um, so one more question before we dive into our tour. Uh, so we're thinking about what types of resources you might be looking for, specifically for remote teaching. Um, and if you haven't yet taught remotely, uh, you can think about, um, you know, maybe some of the hybrid uh, resources that you use that um, you may have students implement for a flipped class model. Uh, do you use live recordings of an experiment, uh, maybe tutorials, walkthroughs, guides of an experiment? Uh, for folks to do at home? Um, do you use simulations uh, or other remote experiment uh, tools? So give you a moment to weigh in on that. You may use more than one, of course. And I think we are certainly seeing uh, more of a, an increase, especially, um, I know I, I work a lot with secondary school teachers, and so seeing an increase in uh, students doing experimental work at home where possible during remote learning. All right. So thank you all for weighing in uh, as we're sort of primed to think about what kinds of resources um, we use in uh, online teaching and kind of keep that in mind as we're on our tour today. Um, I wanted to just share with you as, as you're going to see when we take a tour, Lab Exchange is a, a pretty robust tool that does a lot of things. And so I always like to just sort of point out that, that wealth so you can kind of keep an eye out for what makes sense uh, for you and your learners and what you're looking for. Um, but know that some of these other supports and resources are also available to you on our platform. So uh, we're going to talk mostly today about how you can use Lab Exchange to explore new topics and careers in STEM fields. Uh, and also to design and share uh, learning experiences either with peers or with students. Um, coming soon, we have global discussion forums that are gonna be a great place to discuss innovations either in science or education pedagogy with peers um, around the world. And our content library, we really do have an eye for focusing on uh, applications of science to real world issues. Um, you know, that really is something that speaks to students and helps them, uh, you know, become excited about the work that they're doing in the classroom and in the lab. So understand how that's going to further, um, you know, real world challenges. So uh, we think a lot about that. And we also think about how our library can help to support professional development, um, including for educators, uh, learning new styles of pedagogy, uh, or, you know, deepening their practice in different ways, or that might be, um, you know, lab skills for early career professionals. So it's, it's quite a, a range of um, ways to think about applications for our library. One other feature that we will touch on briefly at the end of our time together today is mentoring. Um, so we are a, a platform that is community-based, as I've highlighted. So this is a place where you can offer uh, your expertise as a mentor or for students, they can uh, connect and um, you know, experience mentorship in a way that they might not normally have access to in their existing networks. Uh, and of course, I'm sure there's going to be more ways that you'll think of to leverage the Lab Exchange platform. So we always invite you to stay in touch and let us know how you're using this. Um, and you'll see highlighted in blue, there are uh, a few features that are specific to um, uh, our accounts. Uh, so an account helps you to customize your experience to really make it your own. We'll highlight some of the ways that you can do that today. But I did just want to clarify that there's a lot that's available from our public library, but some of those customization features, um, you do need that free account. So with that, we're going to hop over to labexchange.org. I always invite folks to, um, you know, follow along in the browser. Uh, that can help to sort of navigate along with us, click on what we're clicking on, um, check out the different pieces of content there. Uh, and please, throughout our tour today, let me know if you are uh, at any point not seeing what I am describing. 
Um, but you should see when you navigate to labexchange.org, you should see our homepage here. And uh, you'll see over here on the side, we have a browse button that will take you to each of the different parts of our site. We are gonna spend most of our time in the library today, getting a sense for the different um, resources that are here and available to you. But wanted to point out that we do have an explore section. So if you are just browsing, just interested in sort of the community favorites, uh, the latest, newest, exciting content on Lab Exchange, you can check out the explore page. I always like to take educators right to the library because uh, I know you're looking for something that's right for your class, for your students. Uh, and so I wanna make that uh, as easy as possible for you. So we'll spend some time there today. The dashboard is where you can really personalize your experience, uh, creating your own content, creating classes where you can share content with uh, students, with peer groups. Um, so all of that customization happens in the dashboard. So we'll, we'll peek in on that. Uh, and then we are going to, like I said, take a, a quick tour of the people tab here, which is where um, you can find everyone on Lab Exchange who's chosen to make their profile public, uh, including uh, mentors. So with that, we're gonna pop over to the library. So once you're in the library, you'll start to see the modular flexible approach of Lab Exchange. Um, so as Pierre alluded to, uh, you know, with uh, MOOCs are fantastic, online courses are fantastic, um, but they're sometimes hard to stick with. I know I personally am guilty of not finishing most of my online classwork. Um, you know, life happens, gets in the way. Sometimes people drop off from these long experiences. So what we were aiming to do is create a modular experience that really supports on-demand learning. So what you'll see here is a library of uh, different learning resources. Some of them are, um, you know, collections of resources, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and others are just individual learning experiences, like a single um, experimental simulation or a video uh, that you can, you know, click on and learn a little bit, investigate a little bit, and uh, and move on. So there's lots of different ways that these library resources can be used. One of my favorite things about the library is that uh, we have content from a number of different sources, and this is only a few of them. Uh, we have quite a lot of different collaborators. Uh, but what's so great about that is that you're able to give students different views on uh, and perspectives on the content that they're learning. So it, it really promotes flexible thinking to be able to show and uh, approach these different ideas um, from different graphical uh, you know, representations, different um, ways of talking about or, or uh, looking at these topics. And so um, part of that flexibility for, uh, for educators is not just having a choice of um, resources, but also uh, different ways to um, you know, share these topics with their students. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, we were first created as a life sciences platform. And so you'll see that the majority of the content on the site does support different aspects of biology. So I know we have at least uh, one biologist with us, um, particularly also leaning towards um, genetics, microbiology, molecular biology, sort of our in-house area of expertise. Uh, but we are quickly expanding. So this is very exciting, actually. We've seen chemistry hovering around 900. It hit 1,000 today, so very exciting. Um, so I'm a former chemistry teacher. Um, so we are quickly expanding out into chemistry, physics, health sciences, um, you know, applied sciences, ways to really help students um, to uh, you know, take away that siloed view of, of science that, I, oh, I have to be a biologist, I have to be a chemist, and really start to see the connections between the different disciplines. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have a lot of content that supports development uh, of other skills. Uh, so as you progress in your journey in science, uh, you know, students might be thinking about applying to college or applying to graduate school. Educators might be looking for um, professional development tools or students might be looking for online learning resources. So all of those different components are here to help support students once they become excited about science uh, to support them in their journey, uh, you know, continuing onward in science. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later today about some of the different types of content available on Lab Exchange. Um, this is also something that we're excited about to be able to offer a number of different modalities and, and uh, you know, ways to um, address different uh, student interests and, and ways that students learn and want to experience the material. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit later about some of our simulations and interactive content. We have um, narratives, which are stories from scientists talking about why they're excited about their research. This can be a really great way to contextualize the different topics that you may be um, discussing with your students and sort of looking at how these are uh, applied by researchers to address you know, real world uh, questions. Um, so these are something that have been very popular with both educators and students on our site. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, we also have the ability to create customized assessments. Uh, we offer some and you can also create your own. 
we have case studies which highlight um, student research. And uh, so that may be something else to think about um, if you're working with students who are uh, doing research or reading primary literature for the first time to have them take a look at some of the resources here that address those uh, specific skills as well. Um, and we have modular textbooks and clusters of prepackaged resources, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later as well. We often get the question of who is Lab Exchange for? Um, and while we want to be for everybody, uh, I think the resources that you'll find in our library are really best catered to supporting um, students and educators in uh, early secondary school all the way up through um, undergraduate. And so uh, you can filter the resources on the library by background knowledge to find what you're looking for. So no background knowledge roughly correlates to, uh, you know, an early high school audience who's perhaps encountering these topics for the first time. Although, uh, you know, we don't want to make a judgment. They could also be appropriate for uh, a university student or an adult learner who's also encountering these topics for the first time. Uh, some would be somebody who's, you know, taken a course in this before, maybe uh, taking an elective course or looking at it uh, again from a new perspective. And extensive would be beyond that. So that's just another tip here for how to navigate. Um, and I'll just quickly highlight for you as well, we've added a new filter recently for language. So we're very excited to be able to offer our resources around biotechnology specifically uh, in 12 different languages. So if you are looking for content to support learners in other languages, you can check that out as well. So one of my favorite features about Lab Exchange is pathways. Pierre alluded to the fact that we really like pathways. So I wanna show you what a pathway is and uh, sort of the power of the pathway from an educator and student perspective. So I'm going to share with you our coronavirus pathway. There's lots of examples on pathways uh, of pathways on Lab Exchange that you can check out and explore. Um, this is one that we designed and released earlier this spring to help students understand the conversation um, that was going on in the media about the connection between coronavirus and bats. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is a collection of sort of bite-sized learning experiences. They're short. Um, text articles or infographics or questions uh, that all address this topic from different perspectives. And by the end of this pathway, students have met a set of targeted learning objectives. Um, and so what's great about this is that, you know, you can take this as is and use this with students. Um, or what we heard from uh, many educators this spring is that they, they took this and made a copy and customized it for their students. Um, we had a great uh, you know, story from some educators in Italy who took this and used it with their students and the students were so excited about the pathway that they actually created their own research projects um, you know, based on what they had learned from this pathway. So that was really exciting to hear. Um, but here's what I love. So you can make a copy of this. You can click these three dots and hit clone. And what you'll get from that is an editable copy of this pathway. So now you can change anything here and adjust it as needed to meet your, uh, your students' needs. So if you are teaching students who maybe are not uh, so interested or not ready to talk about the life cycle of a coronavirus, you can take that part out. And then you can take a look in the library to see what other content we might have related to viruses. Uh, that might be a good fit for your students. So maybe you actually want to show them a representation of different virus here. Um, or maybe I want to make sure that I find a video so I can filter by different types of content and slot in uh, the pieces that are right for my students and for my particular lesson. Um, you can move these around. You can uh, add notes. So this is a great feature, especially for um, remote teaching and learning. So you can add something like, you know, as you watch this video, keep in mind. Um, and you can use these notes to help connect students to experiences that you've had um, synchronously, or you can also use it to kind of stitch together the different um, assets that are in your pathway and help them uh, pull more meaning and connection out of those assets. Um, if you're working with a video, you can also choose to play just a portion of this video if you want to, um, to make the point for your students. And so um, when students click through this pathway, it will start um, you know, wherever uh, you've asked it to start. So, uh, and this is something that you could do at the level of a particular class. 
Um, so I used to teach a, a differentiated uh, multi-level chemistry course um, that was project-based. And so, you know, we were developing the curriculum as we were going. Uh, and so, um, you know, that was a lot of work to put together all of those individual lessons to support different students. Um, and you'd have students who were absent or who needed, you know, a bit more scaffolding in different areas or extensions. Um, so being able to have a pathway like this that you can clone, you can adjust, you can add different pieces to, again, either for a whole class or for individual students, um, it's an incredible time saver and an incredible support for those individuals. So once I'm done adjusting my pathway here, I can go ahead and save that. And it's gonna save that to my personal dashboard. Um, so we, we glossed over the dashboard just a little bit. I'll just show you what that looks like very quickly. The library that we were just looking at, our public library, um, is a collection that we've curated from, uh, you know, building relationships with different organizations. Uh, it's vetted, you know, organizations that have a great perspective to contribute. And so, um, you know, you can trust the content there. Um, but we still want you to be able to uh, customize and, and use content that you know works well for your students that you already know and love, uh, or maybe something new that you want to try. Um, so any of that customization uh, is possible, it just means that that content comes back to your educator dashboard. Um, you'll see the little private lock on all of these pieces of content here. So I can still use these with students, I can still share them with others. Uh, it's just that um, it won't show in that uh, big public library that we were taking a look at. Um, so happy to, to chat more about the distinction between the public and the private library if anybody has any questions on that, but just wanted you to know that again that customization is possible you can add uh, really any teaching resources um, that you need. Jessica, there is yeah. a question in the chat, can anyone create pathways and how is it different from a class and thank you Mario for that question. Yeah, great question. So anyone can create pathways. Um, your students can create pathways if you like. This is a, a great tool for students to be able to demonstrate mastery and show their perspective on a topic. Um, so anybody from their dashboard um, in the My Content tab here can add new content at any time. So you can add individual pieces of content. You can make custom assessments. Uh, you can add images, text, videos. I always like to point out document. If you have um, you know, papers that you want students to read or lessons that you already use, um, you can add those here. And then here's the button that I can use to make a pathway. So if I click on this, you'll see the editor looks very similar to what we were just looking at, but now it's completely blank. So I can add all of my own topics here. Uh, and then I can add all of my own tags um, and I can select content just as before either from that public library here or uh, from your own content as well. Um, this is my son got excited about one of the scrollables we were making, so you can add a picture of him. Um, but you know, you can just keep going here, adding as many items as you like. And again, rearranging things um, however you need in order to um, meet the learning goals that you've set. So hopefully that answers that question. Oh, and how is this different from a class? We're going to talk a little bit later about classes. Um, we have classes which are basically collaborative spaces that allow you to share content um, with specific folks who are enrolled in your class. Um, so stay tuned for that and you'll see how that's a little bit different. Other questions so far? Yes, we do. Um, I think Felix, uh, Felix uh, asked a question. Actually, I can take this one. Mm -hmm. um, so the interface, the interface is multilingual, but the content isn't. How do you handle multilingual content and all translation if possible? So to answer your first question, actually we have a user interface that the user interfaces are translated as well, even though full disclosure, it's still in the works, right? Like uh, you will see, we're actually uh, leveraging our community uh, feedback to improve on the translation of the global interface but the uh, resources that you see are, that are available in another language have been translated by um, experts in the fields and normally those are fully usable for, uh, for, for any, kind of, um, any kind of public, whether it is educators or learners. Uh, and as for the translation, for now it's, um, it, it is like a two-side uh, process in which the team works a lot on the on the translation, but we also uh, we welcome any kind of member of our community who wants to contribute to uh, either improving on the existing translations if there was a little typo or mistake, 
anything that slipped through, uh, you know, through, slipped through uh, the net. Uh, uh, really, if we um, have some very motivated teachers that see some great content in a language and want it to be available in another language and want to contribute to that process, there's definitely something we're open to in the future. Okay. We're, we're receiving a lot more questions. Thank you very much. Um, Mario finds the concept of pathways very interesting. Well, uh, you're welcome, Mario. And as, as you've already heard, I love pathways, and I think it's one of the best features on Lab Exchange. Um, so, Juvil uh, Dario Beka is asking us how will this integrate with the uh, learning management systems? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, I'll just point out that all of the content on Lab Exchange has its own unique URL. So one easy thing to do, no matter what learning management system you're doing, is to share this through your LMS just the way you would any other web-based content, posting the link, um, you know, adding it as an assignment. Uh, so it's nice and flexible in that way, and that works for private content as well. Um, another feature I'll show you here, especially if you use Google Classroom, you can share directly to your Google Classroom there. Um, and so those are the two uh, you know, primary ways that we encourage folks to work with their learning management system. Um, we'll also show you in a little bit our classes where you can monitor student progress uh, and that information can always be downloaded uh, to share with your usual LMS as well. All right, and speaking of classes, I think I skipped a question. Oh yeah, sorry, Mario, I skipped the previous one. Is it different from a class? I think that's the next step in Jessica's tour. So uh, hold on this question. Uh, we will show you around in just a second. Um, moving on to two other questions. Lori asked us if, um, what are the type of uh, license for the materials? Is it CC? Great question. Um, so it's quite a combination. Um, on Lab Exchange, you will see content from a variety of sources. And so we do have some content that is CCBY, like, um, for example, FET uh, has fantastic interactives that are CC BY content. Um, we have CC BY NC content, and we also have content that is copyrighted but is permitted for sharing on Lab Exchange. Um, so that's uh, sort of the range. And uh, we also have public domain content as well. So each uh, piece of content is specifically licensed. Um, so you can see that in the license here. So Lab Exchange standard license is uh, the sort of uh, license that applies really just on our platform um, for the ways in which the content is used on our platform between remixing and sharing, things like that. Um, but you will see some of them designated specifically as CC BY or others. And, uh, oh, um, but also, uh, Jessica, our infrastructure is open source, though. Uh, I think it's important to to, to remind that because uh, uh, it's part of our commitment. Uh, we are building the, the, the infrastructure is built on top of open edX. And so uh, it's really very modular and enables a very different kind of use case and of materials uh, to be hosted and to be um, featured on the exchange. And, and last question before we move on to the class, uh, Felix is telling us, um, is suggesting us to add language to your filters and all filter. As you can see, it's already the case in the library. Uh, you can filter it by uh, languages. As for the general UI, uh, this is in your user say setting when you are a registered user and when you are not. So if uh, you just click the link and didn't create a profile so far, you will see that you can set the language on the uh, on the top right uh, corner of your screen. Uh, it was in the setting, Jessica. Oh, sorry. Uh, it, it's fairly recent. Uh, we implemented <laughs> that uh, a few months ago, and you can see set languages at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. And there you go. You can you can switch the UI to another language. All right. Let me not do that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be lost. Um, the French one is terrific. I, I, I can recommend it. I, I'm working on it uh, very hard to, to, to make it uh, as, uh, as good as possible. Uh, and I think that's it for this first flurry of, uh, of questions. So you, you may proceed to, uh, to, to the tour. Great, thank you so much. These are great questions, and this is exactly what we're here for: is to to give you the information that you're looking at. So keep uh, that you're looking for. So keep those coming. Um, I'm actually I know everybody's excited about classes, but I'm going to hold you in suspense because um, what I'd love to do is actually we we've taken a look um, just briefly at some of these. Um, 
uh, simulations here, but I would love to turn things over to my colleague, Marty, to tell you a little bit more about how we think about designing content uh, and what you can do with some of these um, uh, interactive tools on the platform. So uh, Marty, I'm going to stop share and turn things over to you. Uh, thanks, Jessica. And uh, so, so now, so, you know, please keep the questions kind of coming throughout. Um, this is obviously the best part of the conversation is, is hearing from you. Um, but honestly, I, I feel like this is one of the most exciting things we get to share about Lab Exchange. We, we talked about the purpose of the design for Lab Exchange, which was to make science more inclusive and accessible to people. And you know, while that is spoken to in a lot of the content on the website, I feel like that's particularly well spoken to by things like these uh, virtual lab simulations. So we have uh, 12 of these on the, on, the, on the website so far. They're like basically our, our prize possessions to, to build. We're always trying to build, um, build more of them. We'd love to hear more thoughts uh, from anyone if they have uh, suggestions about how to build these. I'm just gonna like walk through a little bit of, of one type of protocol um, a lab simulation that we have. And I'm just gonna, we, first of all, it's just worth acknowledging that we offer them at multiple different levels. So much about lab exchange is a big 10 principle where we have lots of different topics taught in lots of different ways, taught, you know, like many different uh, themes and variations. Do you wanna learn about, I don't know, for the exam, for example, do you wanna learn about the second law of thermodynamics to build a refrigerator? Do you wanna th uh, think about it to talk about how proteins fold? Do you wanna think about it to uh, think about how to design drugs rationally? Uh, Similarly with the content that we design as well, we are also designing it to be uh, very flexible and suitable for every particular student and user. So no matter you know, uh, who the student comes in, they could pick, you know, do they not have tons of background on this particular experiment? They have a little bit of background, they have a lot of background and expertise and they wanna take like a more kind of um, sophisticated approach to it. Um, but I'm just gonna pick level one uh, to, for the get-go. And you know, without dwelling about the, you know, we have like a little bit of content that context that kind of like introduces the lab technique to the to the user to the student. A little bit about the methods that are involved and we have like little place cards that kind of tell the student a little bit about these as well. I'm going to skip over that as well because that's not too much the fun stuff. Um, and before you can actually do the experiment itself, because evidence uh, in educational research always says that the biggest benefit you get out of um, doing almost any activity is by first critically engaging and making a prediction before you actually make an observation or do the uh, experiment. We ask users to basically predict what they are going to get out of this. So here uh, we tell the user that the purple dye is the largest and the yellow dye is the smallest. And so we ask them to kind of rank order in a pretty fun and interactive way, um, you know, what they expect this, this show to look like. And then the real fun happens, which is uh, you get to basically just get a lab bench unto yourself. So um, for a user who's unfamiliar how to use the, the uh, techniques, we have like the, all the steps kind of very detailed and pointed out. Um, I'm just gonna hide that to kind of just show that really, really the mission of lab exchange is to take users into a space they might not usually have access to, right? Into these lab spaces and to begin to uh, give users an opportunity to practice, uh, you know, engaging with relevant, like uh, authentic uh, lab skills. It's like using a micropipette, um, practicing putting tips on particular micropipettes and getting a sense that there's different tips for different uh, types of pipettes. And if you were to load a gel, that you have to put the gel in the gel box first, and you always have to make sure that the gel is pointing the right way. We do a phenomenal job of making sure that gel always default points in the wrong direction. So the user always has to kind of like flip it around to make sure that it's gonna run in, in the appropriate way. Um, and basically we just wanna provide a fun way to um, bring a user into the act of what is it like to do science? Like if you've never thought about science before and you were interested in thinking about science as a career, how would you ever have the chance to practice developing those lab skills or thinking about how you can use those lab skills to uh, solve a worldly problem? And so here I'm just kind of like quickly walking through th these steps, um, but I think you can get a sense for how we are trying to gamify the act of doing lab techniques. And unfortunately, for some reason, I've done all of these steps relatively well, but normally like if you screw up a whole bunch, let me see, let me screw up on the next one. Um, like if I, uh, let's see. There must be something I can do incorrectly. Like if I try to put the tip on without opening the gel box, it starts giving me a bunch of feedback. And really like this is a, a central focus that we're trying to uh, build a lot in lab exchange, which is that we want these lab simulations to be formative opportunities where people have multiple chances to try something, make a mistake, try something again, 
uh, and get really good at something and feel confident about it so that they can join a lab um, if they never, even if they never thought they would be a scientist before. And so this is really how we're thinking about uh, lab exchange as, as something that can make the act of science more transparent and accessible to people who might not have all these lab materials or might not have the time to do all of these experiments in their class. Um, many times you may only have an, an opportunity to do uh, you know, test out a couple of variables or try an experiment once and the experiment doesn't work the first time, you might not have a chance to repeat it again. But uh, what the beautiful thing about the virtual space of lab exchange is that we have the ability to kind of keep doing the, uh, you know, keep testing different experiments or keep trying the experimental protocol until it works out. And uh, you kind of like figure out, oh, this is how it's supposed to work. Now I kind of get it. Um, and so this is one kind of um, lab simulation that we have where you can kind of actually develop the manual skills of, of doing a protocol and develop those skills before you were to join to a, uh, go and join to a lab. I also want to point out that we have another kind of protocol, which again, really kind of exceed, like extends um, beyond uh, the skill sets that someone would normally do, even if they did have access to a lab, even if they did have the ability to um, practice doing all these skills and they had you know, an amazing lab or university or uh, internship, that they got like an opportunity to kind of practice these things at. And this is called uh, an experimental design simulation as opposed to a protocol simulation. There's a, um, it's not, you, you won't really find that terminology on the website, but I just want to point out that rather than, uh, and again, we have context to introduce the user to thinking about how to design this experiment. And in this particular case, we really cared that we are making science hit home, right? We really want science to be something that, that a user finds empowering. That they see a connection to understand the world, understand how they can shape their world and understand like why science is useful uh, in like a very uh, applicable sense. And so, you know, we took the opportunity to make a, a, a lab uh, activity about how to design a, a vaccine for the coronavirus. And if we were to just um, go to the most kind of interactive and fun step and kind of skip through all the context and introductory stuff, what this simulation is really designed to do is to say, okay, if you were in a lab and you were to start off with these materials, if you had the gene sequence for uh, the coronavirus and we had an expression vector that allowed us to express proteins, how would you go from those meager beginning points all the way to a purified protein that we could use as a putative vaccine for the virus? And so what this involves is requiring the student to understand like what are all the um, uh, uh, inputs and outputs for each uh, a variety of experimental methods. And so, uh, so for the first thing we might have to do if we start off with these uh, pieces of DNA is to cut our pieces of DNA so that we can ligate them into uh, ligate them together into an expression vector. And then we could, once we create our DNA fragments, we can put them together. And then once we create our expression vector of the viral uh, gene, then we can, uh, what do we do next? Actually, you know what? I can't even remember what I'm supposed to do next. So we have a whole bunch of these hints that are basically designed to make this a less intimidating component. We really care about making science totally welcoming, totally inviting, totally empowering, and uh, very easy for a user to kind of hack into and see like why it's important. And again, you know, to really think about how we can think, uh, how we can teach science in a way that inspires users to care about science if they've never thought it's for them before. Uh, so here I'm just gonna like take this hint and that starts filling in some of the steps that I had like forgotten to fill in. So now it's kind of filling in these blue, the steps in the blue box and the steps in the green box. And that this, this is really just to indicate that this is a different type of of um, experiment that you can do on, on lab exchange, um, not just kind of like the, the manual um, developing of the techniques uh, and, and the skills, but really thinking about critically, how is it that like in a lab, you would design experiments, choose to do experiments to go from a beginning to an end. And uh, in that whole process, again, because we're trying to normalize error, we're normalizing mistakes, those are normal parts of the scientific process. Those are totally why we wanna have multiple attempts. You can make nine mistakes in this round. I think there's fewer than nine slots you can even try to put things into. You have multiple hints that you can get feedback on. And then after um, you've designed this experiment, we will take you through a series of results that you can interpret uh, and practice interpreting and getting feedback. Each of the questions that we build in, in terms of interpreting your results, has multiple opportunities. So, if uh, if you pick the wrong answer, you'll get some amount of targeted feedback that will help you figure out and multiple attempts to figure out. Okay, I can kind of understand how where they're going with this. I should pick on the the correct answer from there. Again, in the vein of trying to normalize uh, how challenging 
science can be and that it doesn't always work out the way you expect it to be. We also include troubleshooting sections in all of these simulations. So, you know, we very much believe in this opening line, which is that not every experiment is going to work the first time. So let, let's use this as a training platform in which people can practice thinking about how they, you know, if a mistake happens in the lab, you know, how would they troubleshoot shoot that on lab exchange? So that when they join a real lab, they're going to be able to hit the ground running and know exactly how to, to, how to engage with this. So these are two types of lab simulations we offer on lab exchange. And I'm just going to go back to the, the library catalog um, to look at another piece of content that we offer. Um, which is less about um, really digging into the meat of an experiment and is more about thinking about um, the kinds of scientific concepts that underlie the, the experiments and questions that we think about. And so uh, for that, we have uh, these things called interactive. So like rather than clicking on a simulation, which is what we we're just looking at a moment ago, here we can look at an interactive. And for example, I'm just gonna click on, uh, on one we, we um, uh, lovingly refer to all of these as scrollies because as the as the directions indicate um, that these these are like little lessons little animated lessons that come with motion and like uh, like uh, animations that with in which the text is uh, corresponds with like a, a series of moving images so it's kind of like we hope to really sp bring out um, something that textbooks but st uh, still images really can't speak to uh, because so much about biology and science is about processes that happen um, at different scales and at different levels and so this is a, a scrolly about how gel electrophoresis works that you might want to assign a student in a pathway before they do that gel electrophoresis virtual lab simulation that we're just looking at. Uh, and what's great about these, the reason why we design scrollables is because there are various steps we really want a student to pay attention to. And we don't want them to necessarily have to put the active intention into pausing the video and kind of figuring out uh, or like rewinding and like listening to the same loop over and over and over again. So these scrollables don't have or voiceover, they really have the, the text there. And if a user wants to see like what happened a moment prior to um, previously, they can just kind of scroll backwards and then like scroll forwards again. And it allows like a, a real attention to detail that like a, a video that just kind of like passively moves along once you hit the play button uh, lacks. And with that, I'm again, still happy to answer any questions about these things. You know, we're always excited to be thinking about like new ways of thinking about them, but I'm just gonna throw it back to Jessica from here. Perfect. Thanks, Marty, for taking us through that. And uh, so Marty heads our team who develops this content and uh, thinks very deeply about our approach there. So um, if you do have questions uh, about, you know, how we're thinking about these simulations and, and lab experiences or um, what's coming next, you can throw those in the chat for Marty. Um, so one of the things I want to show you is some ways that we have tried to group some of this content for you. Um, I, you know, we've been trying to throw some links in the chat for you to follow along. Sometimes folks come to Lab Exchange and take a look and say, wow, there is a lot here. How am I going to find what I'm looking for? Uh, so we've uh, attempted to do some of that curation for you. So if you're looking for sort of a, a foothold or where to start, I want to point you to a few um, anchors that may be helpful for you. Uh, so as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, we are primarily a life sciences platform. So some of the um, clusters that we've created here are uh, around life sciences, biology, chemistry. Um, we do have a cluster here around applying to college and one around general um, skills around experimentation. So I would encourage you to check these out. We also have one around CRISPR if you're looking for um, you know, ways to integrate uh, sort of new research into your, um, into your uh, curriculum as well. Um, so just to give you a sense of what these clusters of resources look like, I'll show you our biology cluster um, and our biotech cluster just to give you a flavor. So each of these uh, hexagons that you're seeing here is a different pathway. So we've talked a bit about pathways today as sort of those sequences of learning experiences. So uh, if I click on any one of these, I'll open this up over here. Um, you can see it's a, a sort of a curated collection of our favorite resources for teaching these different topics. Um, so this is kind of, a, again, designed to be a starting place for you, for your students to get inspired about some of these different topics and to, um, you know, think about how you might want to adjust this or incorporate these resources into what you're already doing. Um, and so you'll see uh, pathways here that represent, uh, you know, some of the units that you may be working on with your students as well. Um, the simulations that Marty uh, was showing you, some of these are found in our um, foundational concepts and techniques in biotechnology cluster. So this one uh, walks students through the process of gene cloning over the course of 11 different pathways that highlight different concepts and lab techniques that are involved in that uh, process. 
Um, and, you know, so you can go through here, you can learn a little bit more about gel electrophoresis. And so if we open this up for a sec, you'll see that simulation that Marty showed you initially, but scaffolded now with um, some introductory uh, material that helps students get familiar with the technique of gel electrophoresis and what the equipment looks like before they encounter that simulation. Um, and then you'll see some contextualization afterwards for how this is used in a, a real context um, to address uh, different research questions and then an opportunity for students to um, uh, check their understanding as well. Um, so that's just an example of one of the structures that we've offered uh, for, for this um, simulation, but of course we hope that you'll take it and contextualize it uh, yourself as well. One of the other things that we've offered here is a tour through this uh, collection of resources. 11 pathways is a lot to choose from. So uh, if you're looking for sort of just an introduction, an overview to what genetic engineering is, uh, this is one example here. You could potentially follow these four pathways to get that big picture overview. Uh, or conversely, if you have uh, you know, students who are about to do a particular lab exercise or you know, students who are starting a, a research project and are going to be building a recombinant plasmid, uh, you may want something that's much more um, uh, you know, practical in terms of the application. And so we would recommend this tour here. So, um, you know, one of the exciting things I think about this cluster structure is that it helps you, you know, think differently about your curriculum um, and think about, you know, which are the common hexagons here, which are the common experiences for all students, and then which are the groupings that may, uh, you know, make sense depending on different student um, interests or particular learning goals. Uh, so, uh, you know, lots to explore here in the library. Again, we have um, a number of different clusters here that may be of interest from general experimental skills uh, to, you know, more um, specific uh, topics. This is a cluster that we designed uh, end to end. It's one of our first clusters on um, CRISPR-Cas9. And so uh, there are some great simulations here on running a protein gel and Western blotting uh, that we would encourage you to check out if those uh, resonate with your curriculum as well. So with that, I think we are actually ready to leave the library. We've given you a pretty thorough tour of everything that's here. Um, again, please feel free to keep those questions coming in the chat or let us know uh, if you have questions on anything else that you've seen so far. Um, but now I'm gonna take you over to our classes to take a look at that. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if I may have misunderstood how someone was using the word class and thinking about um, a course. So I would say these clusters that you see here are not designed to be a course per se, but they are a thematic collection of resources that uh, all relate to a particular topic. Um, but we have actual, what we call classes is sort of this collaborative space um, where uh, again, you uh, and your peers or your students can get together uh, to talk about and, and uh, learn about different content. So um, it's pretty easy to create a class from your dashboard here. We have a nice little widget. So in just a matter of seconds, you can have a, a class here related to um, you know, anything, anything that you like and you can enroll up to 300 learners. So if you're running a big class um, for students, hopefully that's not a, a, a limitation for you. Um, and you'll see that a number of my classes here are all related to professional development. That's how I use mine. I tend to, um, you know, have mostly teachers enrolled in my classes. So another way to think about that is, um, you know, co-creation of curricula uh, with your peers or a journal club or, um, you know, other potential applications for, for classes. Um, but I'll show you what the infrastructure for a class looks like uh, as you think about different ways that you might be able to leverage this. So. In a lab exchange class, um, this is you know a private space. You have to invite folks to join, but once they do, they have access to any of the content that you make available in your class. Um, so I can switch to the learner view for a moment. So um, anyone enrolled in my class will see uh, the learner view. If my internet holds up, here we go. Um, so you can see all of the content that's been published here for students to view, and they can go through it in this particular order. Uh, and then I'll show you in just a moment that you can monitor their progress through that uh, as well. As an educator running the course, um, you have the option to add content at any time. Um, you can also, I have some unposted content here that I could be thinking about, uh, you know, putting out later. I could be planning for, you know, in two weeks, this is what I'll, I'll need. Um, so you can add content here to your unposted space using the same add content button that we've seen before. Uh, and just like before, this is drawing from our public library, which again, you can filter. So if you're looking for one of those uh, simulations or interactives that Marty showed, um, you can find those here, add those to your course. Um, or again, you can add your own content as well to make sure that you are, uh, you have the flexibility to add, um, you know, anything that you need 
uh, that you want to share with your learners. And so you can just click add there that will put it here in your unposted section. And then if you click this plus button, it will release it to your class. Um, so we can go ahead and do that. Um, so you'll see it show up in just a moment here. And if I've made a mistake, I can undo that or I could actually remove it entirely from the class if I want to. Um, so this is a great way to really control what students have access to if you want them to just have access to an assignment for, you know, a short amount of time or you don't want them to start until you've done a particular experience together in class, uh, you can use that as a way to um, moderate what they're seeing. And uh, so your learners are all here. So um, when folks request to join your class, you see that here and so you have control over who joins. Uh, if you are running a large you know, lecture class and you have 300 people joining, don't worry, you don't have to click them all at once. You can just approve all at once uh, here with this button. And so the way that your students enroll in the class is through the unique class code that's here. So you share this with your students, just as you would share any information, you can post it to your course website, you can um, send them an email, anything you want. And then your students can join through their Lab Exchange Learner dashboard uh, and request to join the class. Once you accept them, they'll have access to everything that's in your class. So it's a, a nice check that allows you to make sure that, again, all the, the right folks are where they, they should be. If you're running multiple sections, make sure students are in the, the right one. Um, the other thing that's nice about this learner tab is that you can uh, interface with students uh, directly here so you can see their individual progress on different pieces of content. You can assign them individual content, um, so great for differentiation, also great for students who may be um, you know, absent or have missed a, a lab experience and you can help them get caught up in this way. Uh, and then you can also individually message students if you need to check up on, uh, you know, uh, hey Tracy, it looks like you haven't had a chance to um, you know, watch this video, just wanna make sure you have it, you can check it out soon, um, you know, whatever you wanna say to them there. And then in the progress, tab. This is where you can keep track of what work your students have uh, accessed. And um, so you can see what they haven't started or what they've completed. Uh, if it's something like a pathway that has multiple components, you can see how much of it they've completed. And uh, if it's something that has assessment questions, you can see what percentage uh, they've gotten correct. So um, again, a number of different uh, pieces that you can track here and use to inform uh, how you, uh, you know, interact with your learners individually. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of interfacing with your LMS, you can download this information at any time and uh, add that to your regular learning management system. One other great feature of the classes, uh, again, kind of hearkening back to the fact that we're built on the Open edX platform and leveraging uh, the discussion feature, uh, discussion forum feature from Lab Exchange that you see from edX that you see on many of their courses. Uh, on Lab Exchange, we have also included a discussion forum here. Um, so this is private to your class. And so you can post, uh, you know, threads here as you like, um, and students can interact with those and the answers, uh, responses show up more or less in real time. So this is a, a nice way to, um, you know, moderate discussions, to run protocols, to analyze papers together, um, you know, anything that you would normally do synchronously with students, uh, you have the flexibility to now leverage the discussion forum uh, to do that um, either synchronously or asynchronously uh, as you like. So, um, so this is what we uh, mean when we talk about classes, uh, this collaborative space that's available for you to share content, to follow up and, uh, with your learners and monitor their progress through uh, everything that you've assigned. So happy to answer any questions that you may have on that. Um, the last thing I'm going to cover in our tour today is our mentoring feature. So just going to give you a, a quick peek at that. Um, so the last tab in our platform, we remember our uh, browse button from the beginning, we've, we've looked at the library, we looked a little bit just now at the dashboard. Uh, the last part here is the people tab. And uh, as I mentioned, this is where um, folks who have made their profiles public on Lab Exchange um, can, can be found. And you can search by role um, for educators, for mentors. You can search by institution, you know, areas of interest. And, and so this helps you to refine um, you know, what you're looking for. If you are seeking mentorship from a peer or colleague who is uh, perhaps running a, a course um, similar to yours and you wanna get some feedback, uh, you can use it that way. Um, for students, again, who are interested in uh, perhaps learning new lab techniques before applying to um, you know, join a lab or, or do a summer internship, this can be a great way for them to uh, identify folks to help give them that insight too. 
So I've pre-filtered this for people on the Lab Exchange team, uh, just to kind of show you what that looks like. Um, so I'll pick on my colleague Mary here. So um, you know, if I find I kind of have narrowed it down here, so I can click on Mary and learn a little bit more about her. And when I do, I'll see a little bit of uh, Mary's profile here, sort of like a, a LinkedIn profile almost to learn a little bit more about her interests and her background and experience. And then here's where I can go ahead and apply for mentorship um, if I'm interested in that. On the other side, um, I can also make myself available as a mentor if I want to. Um, so here's where you can control sort of whether or not people can see your profile or send you messages. This is very easy to just toggle on and off at any time. So if you're getting a lot of messages or, or um, you know, requests for mentorship, you can change that uh, anytime. So you can add, uh, again, information about your background, your interests here, your experiences. Um, and then you can make yourself available to mentor and uh, you can even add a little bit about um, what you're available to mentor uh, around. So, um, and then you can track your mentors. You can add, uh, you can assign them content. You can um, message them just as you could learners in classes. And so you can do all of that from your dashboard as well. So. Uh, again, just a, a quick peek there at some of the social features, the classes, the mentoring, and coming very soon are our global discussion forums that we're excited uh, to share. It's yet another opportunity for um, folks around the world to connect around science and around education. So that is our tour for you today. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of our implementation resources to help you um, think about how to get started with Lab Exchange, uh, and then we'll make sure that we've addressed any questions that you might have. Um, so one of the implementation resources that we've uh, developed for you is our remote learning cluster. So I'm actually going to head back to the library one more time and show you how to find that. So as a, a reminder, we actually uh, filtered for clusters before, so content type cluster. And then uh, here, the second one is remote learning with Lab Exchange. So um, we are so glad that you're able to spend time with us today and to come on this tour with us and ask us questions. Um, but when we are not there with you, this is a tool that we've put together to support you. So this cluster has pathways to get you started. Um, you know, think about creating your account if that's of interest to you. Think about what the different types of accounts are. Um, you know, how you can uh, think about creating some of the um, different uh, types of content that we've talked about today. It's just a very simple overview of the platform. Um, we have a pathway to help you explore some of the different resources on Lab Exchange. Uh, again, tutorials of how to add your own content, um, each of the different types that you can create. Um, we talked briefly about classes, but this is a pathway that will walk you through exactly how to set that up and what to press and, um, you know, how to add content and all of those pieces. Uh, and then we have some pathways to suggest different ways that you can use Lab Exchange to complement uh, your existing curriculum. So one of the things that we've led workshops on um, for the last several months that's been quite popular is thinking about how to incorporate these lab simulations that Marty showed uh, into your existing curriculum. So this pathway is a, an attempt to sort of cap, capture that uh, workshop experience um, in an asynchronous environment. So it introduces you to the lab simulations, as you saw today, um, kind of what the lab notebook is all about, some tips and tricks from our teacher community as to how to use these in the classroom. Uh, that example simulation that you looked at with Marty today, and then some testimonials from teachers and students who have used uh, this simulation and, and sort of provided their perspective and feedback. Um, and a suggested uh, lesson plan, just offering ideas for how you could implement this uh, in your classroom. So uh, we have one pathway for those protocol simulations that uh, you know, Marty showed, and then also the um, experimental design simulations. If you are uh, perhaps interested in um, you know, building an online community around uh, research or maybe helping your students think about scientific literacy and develop those skills, uh, we have suggestions here as well for how you can um, you know, achieve those goals. And we're always very interested to know uh, what you don't see here. So if there are um, tutorials or resources or help uh, that you're looking for that isn't in this uh, implementation resource, please do let us know so that we can expand uh, what we have here to make it the most useful for you. So um, as promised, with that, I wanna take any uh, questions that we may have. And uh, I know we have been 
um, chatting for a while. So if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to stand up and take a little stretch break uh, while we answer some questions. So um, I have not kept an eye on the chat there, but um, uh, Pierre, maybe you can let me know if we have any uh, questions that have come up so far. It looks like we have answered pretty much all of them already uh, during our first little Q&A uh, break in the middle of the tour. Uh, because uh, no, I don't think, I think we've answered the question on the difference between what is a pathway and uh, what is a, a, a course, right? Not a class. Um, but no, I guess, I mean, of course, please uh, feel free to uh, feel free to let us know. And um, yeah, if some of you have to leave early, uh, it's very kind of you to leave a note. Uh, <laughs> so bye bye, Lori. I think she already left. But no more no, no more questions so far. Um, Great. For us. All right. Well, thank you for uh, checking on that. And yep, as Pierre said, keep those coming if you have them. Um, so then I'm going to turn things over to Marty to give you an exciting sneak peek at some of the things that are coming uh, down the road for Lab Exchange. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing there and hand it over to you, Marty. Cool. <clears throat> Thanks, Jessica. Um, and I will, let's see, just the share button. Yep, I know how to do it, maybe. Um, so, okay, so First of all, we're super excited to kind of continue, you know, building all the momentum. Um, you know, we've built most of the things we've just been sharing with you over the past eight months. Um, and we're really excited to kind of keep building, um, you know, more lab simulations and more content all in that vein. But in addition, uh, we also have uh, a project that we're also super excited about, uh, where we just got a, an additional grant to develop uh, a bunch of content centered around anti-racist and inclusive teaching and science on lab exchange as well. And so we really wanted to put, uh, and particularly we wanted to focus on content that really addressed two areas on lab exchange. As long as science teachers and students are going to lab exchange for their science content, can we also put content that is also supportive of helping teachers and students know how to provide the best, uh, the most inclusive classroom possible, the most equitable and fair classroom possible, uh, the most anti-racist classroom possible. Uh, and also, can we think about how can we develop content that allows challenging topics to be addressed in a science classroom? So, for example, so uh, in particular, we wanted to focus uh, developing a lot of content uh, centered around how racism is a uh, structural racism basically underpins a lot of the uh, public health crises and disparities that exist certainly in America, certainly globally, in many different examples. And that this is a way for us to begin to talk about both a mechanism of understanding what structural racism is, like how can you identify structural racism when you look at it? I, I mean, the public health um, uh, gives us a, an unfortunate large number of examples to, to study in that context with COVID being um, a primary one at the moment. Uh, and also like in that same vein, uh, we also want to develop topics around how can you teach about the genetics of race in your intro bio, uh, biology classroom. Um, and things along those lines. So, you, you know, many things that like teachers, many teachers want to incorporate in the classroom, um, but not are not necessarily sure how to bring those topics into their classroom and and, and feel like, un, like unconfident to like necessarily know how to approach those topics in a discussion in, in their class. So we wanna provide high quality content to do so. We recognize that we are not the best people to, to make this content. Um, so actually we're super excited that uh, the grant that we earned is really directed towards um, fellowships that we can send towards faculty and graduate students um, to write this content uh, to for us. So we we'll, we'll, we'll plan on like collaborating with um, postdocs and graduate students who really are focusing in, in these areas to develop content that uh, our users can make use of it in, in, in a very applicable way. Uh, so that's one thing we're super excited about. And I should say, if any of you are grad students or postdocs who are working in these fields or no postdocs and grad students who are working in these fields, please let us know, we'd love to work with you on this. And then uh, lastly, I also wanted to mention some of the tech, you know, the additional technology that, that uh, is coming about. So we have a video annotation tool that is in the works that we're super excited about moving forward. And I will turn the sound off on this one. But this is uh, an example of a YouTube video that one of the high school teachers who we worked with closely recommended that we should annotate uh, as an example. And just to point out a, a few things here. So here's a, a, a teacher walking through uh, a CRISPR um, hour lab experiment that you can do with your students. And these annotations we make on this video 
or on this lower um, left hand corner, uh, uh, sorry, on this lo lower um, bottom panel that is like the timeline of the video. And they correspond to these um, uh, things that are kind of tracking it on this right panel. And so these first couple of things are like largely um, kind of chaptering. Like these are like uh, allowing people to kind of go to different spots in the video. But we can also embed uh, questions. So like, is the student following along? You know, like what is the target of many antibiotics? What is the goal of this particular experiment? Uh, and we can also ask additional critical thinking questions that you as a teacher could uh, read and, and see like how are these students kind of engaging um, with these topics. So if we were to design a slightly different experiment with a slightly different outcome in mind, uh, how would we be able to uh, interpret those different results? And it's also, um, I also wanna mention more pointedly that when we look at, um, when, when she starts going through uh, things like how you can start pipetting, uh, let's see, I think that that's like this moment, when she starts telling people about uh, the user at home about how they can pipette, we can also uh, link out from that, like annotate that moment in the video and like link out to one of our simulations in which we uh, give students the ability to actually not just watch, but actually practice the skill of micro pipetting um, themselves. So this brings you back to like one of our, our sorry, uh, one of our lab benches where you get to uh, practice the act of micro pipetting yourself. And then, so, okay, so that's an annotated video. And we are also, I'd be loath um, uh, if I didn't mention this very quickly, we also are developing uh, tools to annotate 3D structures and molecules. So here is a, a, a molecule that we probably know uh, relatively well. This is our uh, my favorite DNA double helix. And what we're demoing here, you know, this is still a work in progress. What we're demoing here is that the parts of the molecule that we can annotate. And so like this will be uh, a phosphate group. Uh, and we can basically, uh, one of the ways in which we hope to use this is to have users explore the 3D structures of organs, tissues, ecosystems, molecules, uh, and all the you know all the different scales in which structure and function relate to each other in sciences, and and be able to like make us uh, arguments based on like finding a, a particularly relevant component of of a structure, and identify like why that's so important for the function of that 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 molecule or that organ or that or that thing along those lines. So between uh, the anti-racist and inclusive teaching uh, content grant and things like annotations of both 3D and uh, molecules and videos, we're super excited to kind of continue developing uh, new kinds of assets and to kind of continue to develop the kinds of assets we've already pioneered over the past year. Great, thanks Marty for giving us that, uh, that sneak peek. It's so exciting to watch these things uh, come to life in our group. So looking forward to being able to share those tools um, with all of you soon. All right, um, so we have shared uh, a lot with you, but we want to hear from you. Um, so we wanted to have a, a brief discussion. I know we're, we're a small group, um, but have a brief discussion about, uh, you know, some of the ideas that we've shared today um, and get your sense, um, you know, after what you've heard today uh, about the different resources on Lab Exchange, the capabilities of the platform, and um, some of those future plans uh, that Marty just shared. You know, we want to talk about how these tools can really support equity in science education. Um, and so we have some uh, discussion prompts that uh, we, we've uh, offered here for your consideration. So in a moment, we're going to ask you to vote on which of these you'd like to discuss. Um, so we're going to go back to our WooClap and you'll see a, a choice of one, two, three. Um, so one is, uh, you know, what are we not thinking about yet that you think we should be? Um, again, as I mentioned, we are a small team and, and we work hard to listen to the needs of educators and students. Um, but, you know, I am sure there are things that are not on our radar yet. And so we would love to hear from you what those might be. Uh, another possible discussion question for you, number two. Um, how do you think we could be leveraging the content on our platform? Uh, and we've talked a lot about, um, you know, our simulations and um, some of these tools. And so we could talk about those. We could also talk about our narratives uh, and case studies. Um, the narratives, uh, just as a reminder, those stories from scientists sharing how they got into the field, you know, what they research, why they're excited about it. Uh, and case studies are actually showcasing student research. And so there are ways to help students see that their peers are doing this work and that it's something that's accessible for them. So that's another thing we could talk about um, is how to, you know, make better use of the content that already exists on our platform. Uh, and number three, what role do you think the digital mentorship is playing in increasing equity and diversity? Um, so we've talked a bit about the mentoring tool on LabExchange, 
uh, you know, leveraging this community of um, not just educators, but scientists who can come together to really help lift up the next generation uh, to help them understand uh, and find their way forward in science. Um, so again, we, we would love to hear from you, uh, which of these you'd like to discuss. So again, number one, what are we not thinking about that we should be? Number two, how can we better use our content? And number three, what role does mentorship play in increasing equity and diversity in science? So keep those in mind. Uh, again, we're going to take you back to WooClap here to see uh, if we can uh, get a sense for um, your opinions on this and sorry about that. So here is the uh, QR code, by the way, if you're joining through QR code, uh, we also have the link. Um, so in addition to uh, which discussion topic, um, we're gonna ask you to think about um, sort of your own uh, uh, impression of how the open education community can be addressing uh, issues of um, gender equity and diversity in science. Um, so first one here is uh, your sense of how the open education community can increase gender equity and diversity in science education. So uh, take a moment to offer some uh, ideas, some key words that come to mind for you when you hear this question. And uh, again, if you um, uh, have joined uh, WooClub before, that should be accessible for you. If you haven't, you can just click that link. Um, uh, hopefully, Pierre has dropped that in the chat for you. I just did. But it's, it is indeed a very tough question that takes a little bit of thinking to answer. <laughs> That is true. That is true. This is uh, something that I'm sure, um, you know, we could spend uh, entire sessions on at the conference and I'm sure others are, um, you know, talking about this theme. And so um, we don't, we don't expect to necessarily solve the problem today, but we want to get your sense uh, of um, what the open education community specifically can do here. So I'll give you a moment to uh, put in some ideas, some keywords, uh, maybe open that up to questions that you may be thinking about related to this. Uh, sometimes it's not easy to think about a solution, but it can be, uh, it can prompt another question for you as you as you think about that. Um, so we'll give it another moment for folks to contribute uh, an idea there. I think that may tell us that that's a uh, <laughs> something that perhaps needs a little bit more time for discussion than we may have today. All right. Um, well, so I, I'll leave that for the moment. Oh, lowering barriers for entry. Love that. Great idea. Connecting students with more diverse resources and inspiring models and interacting online does not identify gender or ethnicity. It's so fair. Uh, fair, fair point. Um, that that may be something that's not specified through, um, you know, a portal like Lab Exchange, where you're um, uh, not necessarily signed in and you're just, uh, you know, accessing the resources um, through the library there, and making learning resources more flexible and closer to a student's reality. Love that suggestion as well. Fantastic. All right. Um, so thank you all for contributing those thoughts and uh, it's, it's great to see that people are interacting with those answers as well and hopefully uh, you've seen some um, you know themes today that resonate like uh, you know thinking about how pathways and the annotations uh, you know that Marty showed can be tools for lowering that barrier of entry for making things more flexible and meeting student needs uh, more directly. All right. Um, so again, with the uh, you know dwindling time um, that we have left, we wanted to ask you uh, what you'd like to speak further about. And just as a reminder, I know we talked about those discussion topics uh, a little bit ago now. Um, so if you vote for one, it's what are we not thinking about yet that we should be? If you vote for number two, uh, how can we leverage the content on our platform? And number three, what role does digital mentorship play in increasing equity and diversity in science education? So we'd love to uh, have a short discussion with you, hear your thoughts about one of those different discussion topics. So take a moment to uh, vote for the one that you'd like to either contribute ideas around or hear what others are thinking about. See if we have no votes yet. I'll leave this up on the screen just for another moment so you remember the what one, two, and three uh, mean there. And, uh, you know, I think we certainly, um, you know, have shared some of our thoughts uh, around each one of these today. But again, we're very interested to hear what you think on these topics. 
All right. So you have a couple of votes for number two. And uh, just give folks one more uh, chance here if you haven't already voted to uh, decide what you would like to talk about today. Oh, now we've got three. So I think it looks like it is a, a unanimous decision here from the folks uh, who've decided to vote. Um, so we will open up the floor to think uh, a little bit more about um, what role diverse, uh, sorry, digital mentorship can play in increasing equity and diversity in science. And I, and I know I'm particularly excited to uh, chat about this topic. This is something that I um, think a lot about as we think about how we can improve our mentorship feature to uh, be something that um, can really be uh, a useful tool for, um, for more students. So I'm happy to open up the floor if anybody uh, would like to kick us off with any thoughts um, to start this. Do you have experience with digital mentorship? That, uh, that you would like to share or examples where this has worked well to lift students up? Do you have questions about how digital mentorship uh, can play a role? Um, love to hear those thoughts or those questions. So I'll give everybody a, a moment to think uh, about what they might like to contribute to our discussion today. And you can either throw that in the chat or, or again, we invite you to, to please feel free to just unmute. Um, we're a small group today. that. There we go. Um, so just exercising a little wait time here um, as we think about, you know, the role of digital mentorship. So do you have a question? Do you have a story to share about how that has worked well for your students? Well, I can share a story about being a student and finding like a digital mentor since that time was, is not too far away from me to give all a bit more time for, for people to think about. But um, yeah, actually, I do not have a science background, uh, although I am very interesting, interested in uh, sustainable development education. And uh, I actually took some ecoforestry classes, so mm -hmm. to handle um, environmental services in uh, woodlands settings. And uh, actually, I did that online and uh, found a mentor that I, uh, that I worked with, um, well, the teacher of a, a, a MOOC on edX that I contacted and that uh, mentored me a little bit on those kind of uh, topics and that I rejected in a summer project two years ago uh, with actually part of them being my family members and uh, other people uh, in a small, just small part of France, small town of France. So uh, yeah, without having spoken directly with that mentor, I would never have felt, you know, like the kind of knowledge or legitimacy to, to try to, to bring that to the table um, and, uh, and try to build a project. So, so it was very important for me uh, to get out of my comfort zone and feel uh, legitimate um, in a topic that I would have never thought um, I could have um, built anything in, even though this has little to do, of course, with equity and, di and diversity. But um, I guess that digital mentorship is really this, um, you know, a way to break through walls in a way. Um, and um, I am very fortunate and very privileged to have never felt um, uh, discriminated against in any in any way, but it is easy to um, uh, to, 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 to you know to stop um, to, to set up your own barriers when you feel like uh, you're entering a topic in which you're not really uh, you're not really welcome you're not really legitimate. Thanks for sharing your experience, Pierre. And I, I wonder if that has, um, you know, sparked anything for uh, any of our participants. Uh, have any other thoughts related to digital mentorship or other experiences to share? We want to open up the floor to you. Yeah, I see. I, I see that Max Mahmoud um, unmuted himself and uh, had a camera. Yes. So we would love to hear from you, and welcome. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for, I'm, unfortunately, I, um, my work commitments meant I couldn't join until very late. I just managed to see the end of the presentation, um, but I'm very interested and excited about going back and having a look at, uh, at your work. It looks really interesting. Um, but I think I just wanted to sort of um, contribute to this discussion about uh, digital mentorship. It's, um, uh, it's something that I've been um, quite interested in, um, in, in different contexts. I mean, I, I am, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a teacher, but also a mentor. Um, uh, you know, I lecture um, and, and I do mentoring through different, uh, different programs. So um, it's, uh, this work has kind of um, made me interested in, it's particularly in the work of um, uh, Benjamin Bloom. I don't know how many of you, if any of you are familiar with the work of uh, Benjamin Bloom in the 80s, um, where he came up with what he called the Two Sigma problem. Um, and the Two Sigma, and I'd, I'd really, um, I mean, I think it's, it's a fascinating paper. As I said, it was published in the 80, in 84. Um, and it's something that unfortunately I think has had very little impact on the conversation around, around education. I think in a way it was because it was published a little bit too early. Um, and and uh, what Benjamin, what, what Bloom called the Two Sigma problem was basically based on an experiment that, that he ran where he did sort of a, an experiment on three different groups of students. Um, and one of them was given the normal lecture time-based progression. Sort of, you know, you sit through 10 hours of a subject and then you progress, you know, after each hour, whatever, you move on to the next thing. Um, the typical lecture didactic style of teaching. Um, another group of students would, went through what was, known, what was called a mastery learning uh, progression. So they wouldn't progress to the next topic until they showed a mastery of the, uh, prerequisite topics. Um, and then the third group was basically all done with one-on-one -on -one tutoring, so a mentoring kind of model. Um, and in terms of the learning outcomes as they measured them in the in this experiment, there was um, there was a there was a one sigma difference, basically a full standard deviation difference between if you like the control group, which was the pure lecture group, and the mastery learning group. And there was a two sigma variation. So between the um, control group, essentially the lecture group and the one-on-one -on -one tutoring group. And, and the reason um, Bloom called it the two sigma problem was, you know, based on this um, experiment, they thought like, you know, the best option is one-on-one -on -one tutoring, but how do you achieve one on, like how do you, do you achieve the learning progression level of one-on-one -on -one tutoring in a mass education environment? You know where we can't literally afford to have one tutor for each student, um, and I think, as I said, I think part of the reason why you know it probably hasn't had a lot of pickup is because in the '80s, access to digital mentorship wasn't really an option, and I think in some ways, you know, thinking about digital mentorship and how it could actually help shift um, the learning styles towards something closer to mastery type learning, or even ideally some kind of one-to-one. -one uh, learning progression, I think, is one of the things I've been I've been very interested in in in, in doing. And I, you know, I've, I've been working particularly with with an organisation called Open Classrooms, based in Paris, who've really based a lot of their work around this particular model. Um, and it's really been in very informative and very interesting to to see the impact that that's had. And I think sort of spreading that kind of thinking and that dialogue um, wider in the digital education community, it's something that I'm really interested in. Love it, Max. Always, always, always happy to hear a reference to uh, the Two Sigma problem. Like it's a, uh, so I think like, you know, to some extent, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. Like how do we create those one-on-one -on -one teaching opportunities, right? Um, those mm -hmm. are the, the most effective thing in all education. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I think another, so like a, another spin off of that is, well, it, it is, is the idea of, of the differentiated learning that like a, a pathway or, or, you know, it, like 
almost anything that you could build in, in lab exchange could offer, you know, students who have different backgrounds, who may not have remembered this topic from a prior year, or who have different interests and they want, you know, this topic applied to viruses or someone else wants this applied to developmental biology or someone else wants this applied to, you know, uh, immunology um, or neuroscience. Um, so to some extent, I, I, I'm always trying to imagine like what are the dialogues that happen in a one-on-one -on -one tutoring situation? Like you're asking a person a lot of questions, you're asking them what they care about, you're asking them what they want to learn about, you're mm -hmm. asking if they're following along. And and yes, we want to create, I mean, so 100%, we definitely want to create those opportunities in the mentoring systems as well. And, and Pierre was nodding along when you talked about the open classroom, but I, I was writing that down because I feel like I need to read about that now. But um, yeah. I don't know if Pierre, Pierre wants to speak about it, but would love to learn more about that. But I think that also just underpins so much of what we are trying to do here, which is trying to find something that speaks to the user's values and speaks to their, engage, like, you know, what, what their background knowledge is and helps them, you know, develop a sense of caring about figuring out the next thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think just if I may, just sort of one point about what you were saying as well is that, is that um, you know, I think in a lot of digital um, online learning environments, especially when it comes to self-guided learning and sort of, um, and especially I think, you know, really addressing the issue of sort of equity and diversity, I think, especially if you look at people who are maybe from, um, you know, more disadvantaged backgrounds and, and partly in terms of sort of, you know, Education is hereditary in the sense that you know the more edu the, the higher the education standard that your parents receive, the, the, the more likelihood you are to to to, to you know and, and it's it's one of these things that sort of inadvert is just systemically sort of you know is is it runs in you know in, in in certain social groups just because of the opportunities that are available, um, and I think in that sense you know I think one of the problems with self guided learning and with a lot of digital learning is that uh, learners don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where mentoring can really help, if, even if it's not in um, this one-on-one -on -one tutoring mm -hmm. on, a, on, you know, on, on, a, on an individual skills level, at the very least in being able to let them know what, what, what it is that they don't know that they need to go and look at so that they can then improve their learning and improve their access to the kind of knowledge that can um, sort of move them on to the next level, depending on what their learning path is and what their, you know, what, what the situation is. So I think, you know, that, that, that to me is one of the sort of the key aspects that like having that kind of, uh, th that kind of access to that kind of mentoring yeah. and being able to, prov and for mentors to sort of to be trained to provide that kind of guidance um, while encouraging this kind of, you know, th this um, self-critical approach of like trying to understand what it is you know, how, how can they design, especially in the context of lifelong learning, you know, how can they mm -hmm. learn how to um, seek out the next thing to learn when they don't, if, you know, basically, yeah, when, when, as I said, when they're still at that level of not really knowing what they don't know yet. That's so beautifully put. Yeah, so, so I kind of completely agree, you know, like thinking about like, you know, I, I, I don't, Oh, not, not, you know, I, I always think of myself as a teacher as basically I'm just like a fancy cheerleader of sorts, right? And, and I basically, it, it's always like trying to motivate the student to keep trying to, to care about something else, to think about something they haven't thought about yet. And I, I agree, like, I think that that's really the strength, the strength of where so much um, men, of mentoring can, can come from here because, you know, what motivates someone to click on a simulation or to keep trying or to click on a, you know, text asset or a video and kind of keep trying. And this stuff's hard. It's very easy to forget that, like, you know, when, um, that it's hard to, to learn these things the first time. Um, and, and, and so I think that idea of like instilling that sense of wonder, instilling that sense of like, of discovery, um, of agency, those are humongous roles um, for, mm -hmm. for mentorship and also transparency and just like creating, sharing stories about how we all became scientists and how we fell in love with this stuff. Yeah. And other other thoughts on that? I know I was just thinking about um, the role that that AI will play in this, and and how good AI is at um, helping students uncover what they don't know versus a, a teacher, um, a, an actual human. We believe a lot in, in human intelligence versus artificial intelligence, um, but is there some sort of uh, combination of those that can that can support students? I, I so Marisol uh, has a question. Will the slides be shared online? 
Yes, we will be able to do that. Uh, we will figure that out. <laughs> we will certainly make sure that these are available for you. Yeah, at least uh, as soon as uh, we are done, perhaps, you know, just um, doing away with, uh, with the slides, um, with the quiz and stuff like that, uh, you will have the, the pitch deck on the, on the OEG website uh, page, the one that you use to access this. Perfect. Yeah, I just added the link to the chat window. Um, so the video from today and, uh, and um, will be added there by OEG staff. And also, yeah, the speakers could add your slides there. Perfect. Thanks, Liz. We will make sure to do that. Um, so I, I, you know, I hate to cut a good conversation short. Are there any other um, thoughts that folks wanted to add before we uh, kind of close today? All right. Uh, Just well, please wanted to do thanks, Max Malamud, for this great uh, testimony. Um, and I definitely, I definitely agree with them. Um, it is very inspiring. And the open classroom is a very inter interesting model um, that uh, evolved into something that is close to a, a French uh, version of edX in the meaning that they are really focused on delivering real certificates that have a real value, but they are more centri centered on this um, even more professional professionalizing approach. Right, like they want you to acquire the the the, the, the skills to, um, to to actually start a new position as soon as you're done, or even during your um, during your uh, your your training, um, and perhaps that's one direction that exchange can go in the f future. Uh, but like the mentorship, the, the mentorship uh, is also something that is meant to create opportunity for learners uh, and to start as slow as research, right? Like not go all the way uh, to, to finding a new job, but definitely uh, perhaps one day on Lab Exchange there will be uh, it will there will be some features for learners to um, find I don't know internships and. Uh, ways to get also inside real labs and uh, get another taste um, at uh, doing science. Yeah, and I think Pierre, you're speaking to the capacity for the lab exchange platform and community to adjust uh, and, and continue to innovate and, and adapt as we've uh, tried to do over the last year to the needs of our, uh, our community. All right. Um, well, thank you again for, for contributing thoughts to that discussion. Um, we have, let's see, um, we have just a couple of sort of next steps for you uh, to think about as we wrap up today. Um, you know, we, we really thank all of you for being here today and hope that you've seen something that is uh, useful and helpful for you. Um, we would recommend thinking about creating an account just so you can really explore all of the features on Lab Exchange, on the customization, creating your own content, really thinking about how all of those uh, classes, mentorship features can support you and your students. Um, you might create a class, try it out, invite uh, you know, colleagues, uh, students to be learners in the class and think about sharing content there, whether it's from the public library or something that you've created yourself. Uh, we also hope that you will uh, be inspired to share your uh, share lab exchange with your network um, after our discussion today. Uh, we've really highlighted how um, you know a lot of the power of lab exchange comes from the community and the diversity of perspectives and, and experience that are brought to bear. So uh, we hope that you'll help us to uh, continue to grow that community to support uh, the next generation of students. And uh, if uh, Pierre would be so kind to pop in the chat a link to our post uh, workshop survey today, just so you uh, can give us some feedback and we can improve for next time to make sure that this is, uh, again, as useful to you as it can be. Um, so if you can take a few moments to fill that out, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, and just to leave you with some ways to get in touch with us after today, um, uh, you can join our mailing list for the latest updates. If you wanna hear when those uh, annotated videos and 3D images are coming out, uh, you know, the latest content partners that have joined with us um, and the newest features on Lab Exchange, we uh, release all of that through our mailing list. Um, so labexchange.org slash collaborate if you wanna sign up. 
We are also quite active on social media. So we're at Lab Exchange, uh, so you can check us out there. And if you're interested in a workshop like this um, to support implementing Lab Exchange in your uh, school, in your, in your um, you know, university or college, just let us know. We are happy to accommodate those requests. You can reach out to us at collaborate at labexchange.org. Uh, and we really do hope that you will stay in touch. We're so uh, interested to hear um, how this tool uh, you know, can help you and your students and uh, your feedback for how we can continue to improve. So before we leave today, we have one more question for you. We'd love to just get a quick poll of how you're feeling after our session today. So one more time on WooClap, if you haven't already, uh, click that link um, here. If you would throw that in the chat just one more time, get a sense of how folks are feeling after our session today. Um, I know if you're uh, like Pierre in Europe, you might be a little tired. It's late there. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time wherever you're joining from today. Um, are you feeling ready to use these resources? Are you feeling like this is something you're willing to explore a little bit further? Are you feeling like we said a lot of things and you know, you know you're kind of lost in all of the, the things that we showed you today? Totally understandable. We get that all the time. So, all right. So seeing a, a mix here, some folks are ready to get started. Some folks are ready to start exploring. I'll just remind you one more time to check out that uh, remote learning cluster um, if you are looking for a good place to start. So thank you everybody so much for joining us today uh, and for spending the time with us to learn a bit more about Lab Exchange and for sharing your thoughts. We so appreciate it. It has been uh, a pleasure to get to know all of you. So thank you again and uh, we hope to see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.